Welcome everybody to the World Satsanga with Guy Stephen Needler on the 23rd of July 2016. This is the first of a series of World Satsangas that are going to be produced and broadcast in conjunction with Kevin Moore and The Moore Show. So they'll be broadcast both on my website via my blogs and also on Kevin Moore's YouTube channel as well. This particular World Satsanga will deal with a rather interesting question about um, the amorphous and whether the amorphous has in fact got, got structure. And then we've got uh, a series of questions from two of my readers and um, in, in fact these individuals are from the original World Satsanga which was live. Uh, a little bit of an explanation as to why I've gone to the pre-recorded Satsangas and the association with Kevin Moore. Um, basically the, the the Skype, or the quality of the Skype um, satsangas was dropping because Skype's could become more popular and so the the amount of bandwidth associated with the people who are participating versus the the system's capability to cope with them um, was deteriorating. So I decided to make it more of a pre-recorded opportunity. We're still with questions coming in from uh, participants from the World Satsanga, um, questions of course that are aligned to the work I do and also the greater reality but also I felt that um, having worked with Kevin Moore for five years now in various different ways that it would be useful for us to um, share our resources so to speak and also um, I would broadcast uh, news on Kevin on, on, on my website and also he would also do the same thing on, um, on his website for me. So what we have here is the agenda, which is of course um, a talk upon the, amor the amorphous questions coming from my uh, readers and a meditation at the end designed to um, really bring ourselves together into a synergetic meditative state and amplify our awareness as a process of that. Okay, so the first part is really is understanding the amorphous and how that can be structured. Well, one of the things that <coughs> I have noticed in terms of my own work is that the very first thing I was given was structure to work with. The structure of the multiverse, the different uh, functions of those structures. Uh, indeed, I'm now in the book I'm working on now called The Curators. I'm going into deep levels of structure and, and the individual entities that are maintaining that structure. Um, but even though the structure and the structure above the structure and structure within the structure, one of the things that was starting to become apparent was that actually the structure is created and the structure is created by us, or should I say our true energetic selves, which we sometimes call the Godhead or the Oversoul or the, or the Higher Self. It's, it's that much bigger part of us which was created by our source um, to, a, to enable it to experience, learn and evolve in the process and we do this um, individually and also collectively for, for and on behalf, on behalf of the source and of course on behalf of ourselves as individualised um, entities. And so we, we create that which is around us and everything of, as a result of this I've noticed that there was something else happening in the background, there was something else that was much, much bigger. And during the writing of the of the Origin Speaks and gaining of more, shall I say, understanding of higher levels of structure above and beyond the four dimensions and, and the zones that I mentioned in the history of God, there was something bigger, and that something bigger bigger was the, far, the obviously the, obviously the parts of the Origin that the, that the source entities were created to work within. But the interesting thing is that that which is not particularly structured, that being that which is not particularly understood or is being worked with or has naturally become a sentient energy with sentience later being able to disconnect itself from that energy and move freely around the energies is initially amorphous 
And so we have a slight dichotomy here in so much as the reality of the greater reality, the greater environment that is clearly the source uh, and the other source entities, and that area within the origin that they are working with, and of course the origin itself is working with, is largely unmapped. And that largely unmapped area is amorphous. There's no structure there. It is completely latent in all shapes, ways and forms. And so what we find here is that there is the vast majority of what is, is not structured. It is completely random. It is completely dis disassociated with any form of structure. It is amorphous in all ways, shapes and forms. But what, what is amorphous and, and has to, at some point, gain structure. And so if you think about the amorphous as being the ultimate building block, the ultimate brick, so to speak, the ultimate DNA, although DNA is obviously a function of the physical universe, then we start to realise that the amorphous is that which can and is moulded into what it needs to be. And what it needs to be is something that can allow the origin and, the, and through, through the source entities, the origin as well, and through us, the source entities, and, the, and again the origin, is able to understand itself. And so in, 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 in understanding itself, it has to, for the want of a better word, play with that which it is, manipulate that which it is, change that which it is, to try to understand the different, shall we say, forms that can be created or can be experienced via that which is formless, that which is amorphous. And it's interesting that um, Eckhart Tolle talks about the formless being the dominant um, environment that we, that we exist within. And, and he's absolutely right. We are in a formless state. And there's other authors as well who also talk about being in a formless state. But unless we understand that the formless state, the amorphous state, is the primary state of what we are, and everything else is created to allow that which is formless, ne but nevertheless sentient, to experience itself, then we start to realise that the amorphous can only be experienced through the creation of structure of some sort. And even in the definition of something being amorphous, we are giving it something to identify it with. And that identification is that it is amorphous. And that in, in a further definition is giving it form or giving it structure. We are assigning something to it that we can understand and we can work with. So in, in essence, the, the greater reality is, is amorphous, it is formless, it is purely latent in every way, shape and form, in its intention to be something. And that intention to be something allows things like sentience, or should we say, the, 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 the steps of consciousness, the, or the, the steps to sentience to happen through energies or whatever, I mean energies in their own right are, are a form of structure of the amorphous, which allows them to become, to coalesce together, to group together, to become synergetic in whatever they are together, and you know, smaller levels of intelligence can be created, which creates higher levels of intelligence, which creates consciousness, which creates self-awareness, which creates... Um, creativity and self-awareness of that creativity and the desire to create more as a result of that creativity and on top of that as a result of that becomes sentient and so the sentience is generated through the coalescing of that which is amorphous into a structured sense so sentience in itself even though it is initially either assigned to an energy or well, if, it's, if it becomes, if, if sentience in its own right, for instance, becomes attached to an energy through the, the energy evolving or progressing, then the sentience can dis, 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 um, disassociate itself from that energy. And so the amorphous becomes sentient as well. 
through the use of that which is structure. So in terms of the, the comment about can the amorphous become structured or, or the amorphous is structured, the amorphous, the amorphous by definition or the formless by definition has structure because we're assigning a thought process to it to understand and describe it. But also that which is amorphous is amorphous by definition and experiences amorphous existence. And so that is a normal state of being. So if we think of it another way, if the normal state of being is the amorphous, how can that which is amorphous can, can evolve further? And the only way that that which, is, that which is amorphous can evolve further is through the creation of something which is not normally experienced by the amorphous, and that is structure. Something that is structured is created, and the different types of creation of structure is infinitesimally large. And so we are, in every way, shape and form, creating out of the amorphous something that we need to experience to allow us to experience, learn and evolve. And we pass that on to our source and our source passes on its experiences through us and its own, and its own work to the origin and the origin taking on board its own work plus what it's gained from its creations gains an understanding and an evolutionary progression and also above that because the evolution is just part of a greater level of progression an understanding of that which is amorphous through the generation of structure and form. That form doesn't necessarily need to be physical. Remember, all of you who are listening to this, this, this world satsanga are in the lowest state of form, the lowest frequential state of form, and have to use a vehicle, the human body, and other vehicles that are out there in the physical universe to experience it. So we're experiencing form and structure in its lowest sense. But this form and structure is a creation. And we've all worked with that creation to allow us to understand it and, and work with it and understand that which, is, which, was, which was primarily amorphous in its structured and formed state. Okay, so that's the little lecture on the amorphous and how that can be structured and, and what it means really. And of course there's a whole huge philosophical debate that can go around this and I've no doubt it would be the um, the ideal opportunity for a number of different forums to experience this and work with it and, and move forwards with it. And uh, I do invite people to use the forum uh, for the greater reality on the uh, website, which is www.beyondthesource.org. And um, feel free to throw questions into the, to the forum and even throw questions into Kevin Moore as well, because Kevin Moore is experiencing his own levels of awareness and enlightenment and an and awakening process as well and so he's also in connection uh, with Source uh, at, at a higher level than he was previously as a result of his awakening process and so he's now able to communicate on a higher level whilst also being immersed in his um, in incarnation. Okay so what I'd like to do now is go through the questions that I've been given from uh, Two of the original World Satsanga uh, participants, and uh, the questions are always deep searching, and they also, and they also do take a quite a lot of time. Now, in the in the the live World Satsangas, we were able to have, um, shall I say, a number of different questions that were asked in a dynamic way. So when we were having the World Satsanga, the questions would be answered, and I I tend to get these questions from the Claire clairsentient side of myself, so it's cosmic knowing if you want to call it that, um, but also some of it is channeled directly straight away. So the information comes to me and I give the, the answers to the information straight away as well. So although from the recording side of things it appears that I'm answering a question that's been given to me uh, as a result of, of an email and those people who um, listen to the, the satsanga in this way can ask questions if they, wish, if they wish as well, via sending them to the forums. And um, we have a, uh, one of my participants is going to manage the forum as well for us, so that's, that's going to be good. Um, you can also ask questions this way as well. So 
the questions that we used to have in a dynamic way uh, on the spot will now happen um, more in, in more of a remote way through, via the forum. I'd like to hope. I'd like to think. Um, but in in doing that, it becomes more interactive with a, with a wider group as well. So it's a, it's it's a it's a, a much better and a much more reaching way of doing things. Okay, so let me just have a look at the first question. So the first question is, what is the difference in having a sense of God communion, being a servant of God, versus being God realized, versus God realized, versus origin realized? And do we all become God and origin realized at the end of the multiversal cycle, when we recommune with our source? Okay. Now this is an interesting uh, question because it means that you know, what is the difference between self-realization and God-realization and origin-realization? Um, <clears throat> I'll deal with the self-realization first. Self-realization is, is in effect a function of us through personal training, dedication, meditation, being able to communicate with our true energetic self, our higher self, our, our oversoul, or Godhead, depending upon which word you want to use. They all mean the same thing. They all are attributed to this much larger um, function of sentient energy that has projected a small aspect of itself, what we call a soul, into a, a form, uh, a vehicle, to allow it to experience the lower uh, frequencies of the, of the multiversal environment. And so really self-realized is the understanding of self uh, in a higher sense and communicating with the, the higher self or the true energetic self in a higher self as well. And so it's, that's a function of that. God-realization is, is when the individual breaks free of the, shall we say, the feeling of weightlessness, the feeling of being swept along in the air in the sea, the, 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 the contentment state associated with communicating with and being in communion with our true uh, and higher selves, and moving beyond that, and being in communication with the, the creator of ourselves, our source, um, what we call God. And so in being in, able to break free of our self-realization and move upwards to, towards God-realization leads us towards being in communion with our source, our creator. Now, there's a function that, that stops most people as being associated with being uh, in communion with Source, and that is experience of the bliss state. And so the bliss state is a function of the high energies, the super high energies, or mega high energies, if you want to call them that, that are the resulting uh, effects of communing with Source. And so, in a lot of senses, a lot of the meditative practices that um, people are taught lead us to get to that point and not beyond. The feeling of bliss is so immersive and so delightful that we want to stay there. And <clears throat> in staying there, we stop ourselves. We stop ourselves from moving forwards and communing with our Creator, communing, communicating, understanding and working with our Creator. And so the God-realization part of it isn't specifically about experiencing this bliss state um, and all of the wonderful feelings associated with that, which is above and beyond that which we experience when we in communion with our true energetic self, but it's also about breaking beyond that and being in communication with our Creator, our Source. And that in itself is a blockage by the way. And so what we, what we can get is a situation where we think we've made it when we've gone past the bliss state. We think we've made it when we are communicating with source and we know we're communicating with source. And by the way, it's a subtle difference between communicating with our true energetic selves, which are in essence an individualized unit of source, and actually communicating with that wider energy or sentience that is the source entity. And so we have to be careful that we can choose the 
energies or the state of beingness that is associated with communicating with higher self or trinity self or godhead or oversoul versus the creator the source so when we understand that we're communicating with source <coughs> and we're experiencing this it's then a, another leap again to break beyond that now in my experience it is personally possible to communicate with our creator's creator and it's something I've been honoured and blessed to be able to do but I think that it's it's also a function of one's evolutionary level that that being the evolutionary level of the of the trinidad itself in being able to become origin realised to understand that there is something beyond God and I'm just going to quote something from a a book that I read a long time ago and I don't tend to read books because I, I'm a bit uh, concerned about things being stored in the the subconscious mind as it were and then being regurgitated later as, as, as potentially my own material but then this, this, this particular instance I can relate to it totally there was a, a book um, by a follower certain in the, in the latter period of his his work of Paramahansa Yogananda and he was talking to Paramahansa Yogananda in his book that, that describes his, 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 his life and his, and his influence by this, uh, this, great, uh, this great sage and guru and he asked the question how many people progress beyond God? How many, how many of the saints because Yogananda classified great gurus and great yogis as saints so how many saints move beyond God? And the answer that Yogananda gave was, not many, very few. And the reason for that is, that he gave, was that they get stuck in, the, in the, the, the bliss state. They think that they've achieved the ultimate level of communion when they have got to the bliss state. And they don't move past it. And so Yogananda knew that there was something beyond God. But he also knew that only a few individuals would go past that in the world and only a few individuals would be able to work with it in the world. And so I'm, I'm, I'm fully of the belief that he only taught to a certain level because he realised that mankind or incarnate mankind can only cope with certain levels of, of understanding and of communication at any one time. Now, Yogananda was around in the, in the 20s, 30s, 40s and, and 50s, uh, or the early 50s actually. And so at that point we were, we, were, we were at a different evolutionary state whilst being incarnate. That is a long time ago, it's been nearly 60 years ago actually, uh, probably 64 years ago actually, that Yogananda mentioned that to Roy Eugene Davis because it was, it was in about 1951, 1952, he talks about this particular aspect. But it's, <clears throat> it links in quite nicely because at that point there was probably only Yogananda and one or two others who could communicate with that which was beyond our creator, beyond our source. And so now we're we later, later on, we're 60, 64 years-ish beyond that point, we are a higher frequential state. And so it is possible for those who are super dedicated, who make it their life's work, to move beyond that which is God, and communicate with God's creator, the origin. And so in that instance, you move again through a different level of this state, a completely different level of disassociation from that which you are, and you move into this great vast sea of, of everythingness, of absoluteness. And the, the, the Hindus called that which was beyond God the absolute. Um, and it's, it's, it's well documented by a number of really... Um, old books that, that are available. So if you just type in the absolute into um, into Google or something, or even even maybe ebooks, you can find that there's a number of books out there that talk about this. So specifically, those talk about ancient mysticism. They, they, they talk about the absolute, and the absolute is the origin. And so moving beyond God to the absolute, we experience again this wave of energy, this this completely different state of immersive content that can again stop us from moving beyond that and communicating with origin and so if you have to if you've moved beyond the, the state of um, 
floating weightlessness and joy that we get with communicating with our higher self into this completely bliss state that's associated with communicating with source. You move beyond that and communicate with source. Then you move into a different level of communion with origin. And then you can then move beyond that level of feeling associated with it and then start to commune with origin. So in that case, origin awareness is achievable only by handfuls of people. And so that's the difference. But the difference that I'm describing here is a very poor description. I'm using human terms. You, you have to experience it yourself to know the difference and to understand this level of um, almost being trapped in bliss. And the being that being trapped in bliss stops you from moving forwards. Okay, so we'll work on the second question now. So the second question is, uh, why do some enlightened, God-realized human beings dismiss or reject any notions of a multiverse or omniverse just as another belief system concocted by some authors? Is going beyond God our gold in this or other lifetimes? Um, the only way I can describe or answer this question is to say that they get stuck in the bliss state. And they also, as a result of getting stuck in the bliss state, they basically start to experience what I'm going to call pseudo, um, um, the pseudo-amorphous state. Because being stuck in the bliss state means that you, you're not experiencing anything other than bliss. And so being in this bliss state gives you this feeling of pseudo-amorphous or, or pseudo-formlessness. And we, um, we, we, we miss the little bits of structure that are above that. So when I talked about the first, the first question, the, the, well, in, in the talk first, the, the, the lecture, so to speak, on, the, on what the amorphous being structured, or how can the amorphous be structured? The, those individuals who go into the bliss state, they feel the essence of amorphousness or formlessness through bliss. And so, unless they can break free of that, they will never experience the higher levels of structure. Now, one of those higher levels of structure is source and the other sources. One of those higher levels of structure is the sentence that we call the origin or the absolute. And so what we have here is the need to demark what is sentience and structure within that which is unstructured as being a function of the structure. <laughs> that sounds a bit convoluted, doesn't it? But in essence, when we start to understand that we have created a structure to work with, but that structure is a way of experiencing the amorphous, then we have to think about the, the, the fact that the multiverse and the omniversal state, if you want to call it that, in terms of an environmental condition that's experienced by the source entities in the areas within the origins, poly sentient state of self-awareness, then we have to understand that that is the amorphous. The structure is the amorphous. The omniverse is part of that which is amorphous. It's just a small part of it which is being experienced. That, again, that which is naturally amorphous is understood by the amorphous because it's amorphous. However, the way to experience in a greater detail, one needs to work with that which isn't amorphous. And we have to create from the amorphous the form. The form. We go from the formless to the form to understand that which is part of or can be created through this completely um, uncreatable created state that can be creating something else. Everything is latent. Everything that ever was is. Everything that ever is, will be, could be, should be, will be, might be, is always happening now. And so Individuals who, who meditate and they get to these bliss states, they experience a bit of the amorphous. But in experiencing the amorphous through their, 
their bliss state and through their meditations, they're actually having to move through structure to get to that state. And even though they're getting, they're blocking themselves but not moving beyond it to go through higher levels of structure to get back to return back into the amorphous state. And that, that amorphous state being f functions of the source and functions of the origin which is currently un unmapped or, un or, un being, or isn't being classified as being sentient. It, it's latent. It's latency. It's just latency. Uh, then they dismiss the fact that there is structure there. Again, I'll say it. The amorphous, in understanding itself, creates that whatever it creates is structured. Because in the, the in the assignment of something as being a for, amorphous, we are creating a structure. It might be a structure of one thing, but it's still structured. And so, the if you like the um, the denial of structure within the amorphous is the denial of the amorphous full stop okay so that was a good question actually um, it's just because we get immersed totally in a bliss state that we get lost in that bliss state and that we feel and have a, a pseudo experience of amorphousness that we start to think that there isn't a structure there but the the amorphousness is the highest part of the structure. That which is created is a function of the creation of that which is formless into the form. Okay, so I thank um, thank you for that uh, question. You know who you are, and uh, I've got another question now, which is more sort of earthbound. So this third question is a little, is a little bit series of it's, it's almost a series of nested questions here, and the question is: um, uh, as you are well aware, the world is now experiencing chronic terrorist attacks with hundreds and thousands of innocent people being killed or wounded, as well as indiscriminate shooting of police officers in the U.S. So what's causing this to occur? And there's a number of examples that could be causing this to occur here, but it's basically um, looking at it from a human perspective. Poor leadership from the US or the EU or the UK, poor leadership from elsewhere, other factors of de devolution of society as we know it, um, and what can be done? And th there's a number of examples here of what could be done. One of those could be could be send the perpetrators love or hunt them down and, and, and kill them or, or put them in prisons, or stand by and witness thousands more people being slaughtered. Uh, is this the beginning of a general breakdown of the current power and financial structure as we know it, or a passing phase that will run its course? And what is to be learned here? Well, there is a, a level of resistance being experienced right now that, uh, worldwide. And that level of resistance is creating discomfort and disharmony. And uh, I'll, I'll explain what that level of resistance is. In effect, we are, as Dolores Cannon would say, moving into a new earth. And this new earth is a higher frequential state. And in this higher frequential state, we experience more of the content of the physical universe around us. And this basically means that we become more aware of self, more connected to our true energetic self, or God, head or over soul, um, or higher self, whichever word, those words or those descriptors you want to use. And we also become more aware of the greater reality around us. And so we can become more understanding. Now, those individuals who experience this move up the frequencies and start to be exposed to higher frequencies as well. And they have an upward spiral where the higher frequency they get to, the more they experience, the more they progress, the more they evolve whilst they incarnate, and the more able they are to be exposed to higher frequencies. And in being exposed to higher frequencies, they get more experiences, they become um, able to function in higher ways, um, they're not, they see beyond the human condition and they move up the frequencies and, th and so, forth, so on and so forth and this becomes like an almost logarithmic or even sometimes a geometric progression the, the functions of the two are, are, are pretty similar but in essence the more the, the higher frequency they are we are the more, the more exposed we become 
to higher higher frequency ex ex experiences, functions, and environments, and as a result of that, we get pulled up the frequencies. So we, we have an upward spiral. Now, those individuals who are not able to move up in that way stay where they are. And some, um, in fact, an awful lot of the, the incarnate population of the planet, uh, specifically if they're surrounded by individuals of the same type, um, go down or, stay, or, or at least stay where they are. And so they go move down the frequencies and they become even more fully immersed in the um, the incarnate state, the incarnate beingness, and they become very materialistic, very self-centered, very uh, narcissistic, very uh, aggressive, very defensive about who and what they are. And they, these individuals in sensing these higher functions have a level of resistance against it, and they become angry because of the this harmonious state of being that where they are one sort of individual being exposed to a higher frequency and they resist it. And um, as Jesus once said, it's easier for a camel to go through the eye of a needle than a rich man to enter into the house of God. And this is a classic example of how difficult it is for somebody who's immersed in their incarnation to give up all of the things that they hold dear whilst in that incarnation and move into a, an understanding that their real existence is a much bigger as aspect of what they are, and then that the incarnation here is, a, is just a, a, a blink of the eye, or, or even less than that. And so we get this, um, shall I say, this harmonious condition. Now, what happens then is, when we get into this, this disharmonious condition, we try to seek out people who are of the same type. And so we gain communion. Now, this gaining of communion is a fundamental part of what we are. We want to re-commune with our true energetic self, and when our, when our true energetic self has evolved to a certain level, it wants to re-commune with Source. And so this communion part of us is a fundamental p state of being. And we commune with whoever and whatever we are. So in this instance, Although people who are functioning at a higher level uh, and want to experience higher frequencies tend to commune with people of, of good nature, of spiritual nature, and of progressive nature, and of understanding and accepting nature, those who are working with lower frequencies want to commune with those who are working with lots of conspiracy theories, um, have aggressive thoughts and tendencies, materialistic thought processes. They are... Their thoughts, behaviours, and actions are consistent with somebody who is of a of a lower evolved state, and so some some of, some people um, start to behave in extremely low levels of of, of evolution, re returning us back into the medieval ages, and that's why we get some of these outbreaks where somebody goes completely mad, for instance, and attacks. Um, people in, in the street with bombs or knives or, or guns in schools, those sorts of things. And so we have these, these individuals who set these things off. But on the other side, although it's a function of areas of locally low frequency and those individuals being immersed and consumed by those locally low frequencies and doing things which are, shall I say, attributed to the thought processes of being in a, in, a, in a low frequency environment, there are aspects of those things which do some good. Now when we have bigger world uh, atrocities, for instance, like we, have, you know, we, have, we have genocides, we have, um, uh, we have recently we've had bombs in, in, in one of the Turkish airports, um, and we've had coups as well, or attempted coups, and we have other terrorist attacks everywhere else, um, and even wars. The continuation of wars, and some of those continuations of wars have been held in the name of religion, and, and, and the deities that those specific religions um, uh, relate to as well. It's because they are in, they're sucked into this lower frequency activity, this, this, this karmic activity. But on the other side, it creates a good part as well. And this good part, this good component, is that those individuals who were... Shall we say, on the edge of 
moving up a frequency, would start to see how incorrect low frequency existences and low frequency actions are. And so they will start to work together in one mind, think, realizing that it's wrong, realizing that it's, it is not the way we should be going as, as, a, as, a, as an evolving being um, who is evolving whilst in a, an incarnate state. And they will work together to try to alleviate the problem. So we start to get um, individuals who um, start to work as care workers, they start to work as in, in, in rescue and emergency situations, giving their time and their, and their freedom up and, and, and their, their own financial condition and to, by, by donating to, to, to help recover the situation. And so they create a, a different state of beingness where those who are on the edge of get moving up get pulled up because they, they, they feel sympathy and love for those individuals who are the, um, those who have suffered from the actions of those who've gone into a, deep, a deeply immersive low frequency state. And so the positive side of it is that people start to work together in a higher sense. And because people start to work together in a higher sense, they start to think in the same way. And that level of thinking creates a, a synergetic link between them all. And they naturally become associated with higher states of thinking as a result of that, and higher states of being. And so, although the actions of these individuals who have been sucked down into this lower frequency state and they start to behave in uh, abhorrent ways, and we start to have terrorist attacks and we start to have individualised conditions uh, breaking out, um, the upside of it is that we start to think of how abhorrent it is that we shouldn't be behaving in this way in our, in our current civilised way. And so these little pockets of low frequency um, are counteracted or counterbalanced by a, the groups of individuals who start to work um, in a more positive way to help out the victims of these, of these actions. And this is the same thing for sort of big... For the, on the bigger, the bigger arena where we have things like tsunamis and earthquakes, where it brings people together. The little, those little areas of, of low frequency activity create a bigger effect where it brings people together who are, work, who are working in a, in a state of um, concern and love for those who, who, are, um, who are in the victim, the victim areas. And those individuals who've been... Um, pulled into this arena and have created the atrocities, we really ought to help them as well by sending them love. And so, although it appears that we're standing and doing nothing about it, actually in helping the victims, we create a, a synergetic, synergetic environment of a higher frequency. And by sending the perpetrators um, love, we also help to increase uh, the the energy associated with them. And because we, if we collectively send them in a synergetic way, the higher frequencies, they, be, they become affected by it as well. And although they, there was initially a disharmonious effect which created this downward spiral, the collective synergetic effect of us all wanting to help that person or people or country to, to become better actually starts to create an interface between the high and low frequency, the high and low frequency uh, conditions, so that we don't get the disharmonious or the or the rejective state associated with the, with a disharmonious condition, and so they're st they're able to accept the higher the higher frequency energies, but not in big chunks, but in small, achievable, baby baby steps, so to speak, and so they eventually get pulled up as well. But this takes quite some time. It's not something that happens in you know, an instantaneous condition. It does take a little bit of time, you know, years sometimes, or even lifetimes, to change the course of a whole um, ethos and or country that uses an ethos to do that. So it, I hope this has answered the question, but it's all a function of us being in a state where there are individuals who get pulled down to lower frequencies and they start to behave in, in bizarre ways because of the thoughts, behaviours and actions associated being with, with in low frequency states. But also it gives us the opportunities to um, 
work in a higher sense as well and show how things should be done by being good examples. But on the other side, one thing I haven't touched upon is that there are a number of individuals who are backfilling for us. And I've mentioned this in previous satsangas, where we have um, a genre of, of soul, which is incarnating into the human form, to provide um, the base minimum requirement of, in, of incarnate individuals who are working on certain frequential levels to allow those individuals who are still not quite moving up the frequencies to move up the frequencies. So they're providing this balance to allow, allow people to evolve and move up the frequencies and move into the next frequential levels associated with the earth and not, and not create this, this appearance of people disappearing. And so there's backfill people, uh, they're a lower um, quality of soul are incarnate into the human body to maintain a, a level of population, if you want to call it that, that, that allows those other um, the higher quality genre of, 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 of souls who are experiencing low frequency experiences to give them the chance to eventually ex start to experience and work with higher frequencies as well without giving this appearance of um, lots of people disappearing on the planet. Okay, so that's what they're there for. They also benefit as well, of course, with it. But the long, the, the, one of the biggest issues is with these lower, freak, lower quality souls is they do get immersed in the incarnate state and they do get addicted to the sensations, the thoughts, actions and behaviours associated with being incarnate because many of them have never been given free will. In fact, in fact most of them have never experienced individualised free will. And so it's a little bit like being in a, in a, <laughs> in a sweet shop. If you're, if you're in a sweet shop with all the sweets, which sweets do you have? So, you get, you, you know, so a child goes running around taking all the sweets. And this is basically what happens with the backfield people. They, they want to experience everything. And they, they do get consumed with the lower frequency thoughts, behaviours and actions because they are quite, uh, they're quite addictive in all, in all ways, shapes and forms. So I hope that's um, answered that particular question. Um, quite a long answer, and uh, actually quite esoteric as well. Uh, in, fact, the, in fact, the answers to all of the questions, the, the, the three main questions we've had in this, this satsanga, are quite esoteric from a lot of people's perspective. But this is because it's a higher level thought process associated with them. And um, we shouldn't get angry about what happens around us, but send love to negate what happens around us and that for me is the best way to move forwards because when we do we, when we do respond with the thoughts and behaviors and actions of those which are considered to be low frequency I'm not saying negative here I'm saying low frequency if we respond with higher frequency thoughts behaviors and actions we do start to, neg to negate it and we do start to tip the balance towards the higher frequency um, thoughts and behaviors and actions of everybody and the base frequency of the Earth rises as well. Okay, so looking at the time now, it's time, I feel, for us to work with the meditation I wanted to work with, which is to create a, a synergetic effect uh, which will amplify our own connectivity. Okay. So whilst you're listening to this recording, I'd like you to find a, a straight-backed chair. Okay. If you wish, you can sit down cross-legged. Those of you who are a little more supple may, may wish to be in half lotus or full, full lotus. But um, just cross-legged is okay, and just sitting on a straight-backed chair is okay. But if we sit on a straight-backed chair, in any event, we need to have our feet flat on the ground. Our, the small of our back in the right angle aspect of the chair, and our back straight. Eyes closed, next neck erect as well and our hands palm uppermost on the upper thighs that's that parts of the legs which interface with the lower body and our closed eye vision focused on the area which is in between the two eyebrows and above the bridge of the nose this is the origin of the third eye okay the third eye chakra is something else third eye chakra exists in a similar area What I want you to do now is just concentrate on my voice, 
forget anything else that's in the forefront of your mind, jobs, activities, things that you're going to do afterwards. Dedicate this time to this particular meditation. And we're going to use a process that I've used quite a lot within the satsangas in the past. And I want you to visualize that you're in a white corridor. A long white corridor. And as you look down this long white corridor, because you find yourself at one end of this long white corridor, you see that there are no doors on either the left hand side or the right hand side. But at the far end of the corridor, there is a door. There's a single door. So I walk down this corridor. As you walk down this corridor, you find yourself becoming more and more immersed in your meditative state. Walk closer and closer to this door. When you get to the door, open the door and you find a series of chairs in a circle. This room is a completely white room. All of the chairs are white as well. So turn around and close the door behind you and walk towards one of the chairs. Doesn't matter which chair you use, any of the chairs will do. I'm not going to say how many chairs are there because it, it's immaterial. There's always a chair for you. And there'll be other people dialing in to this and downloading this satsanga meditation and the satsanga itself. And when they do so, at what type of time and day they do so, irrespective of what day it is and how long in the future it is, they'll all become part of this particular meditative condition. So all time zones or event spaces lead to this particular event space. By association with this particular recording, you are all here now. So you've walked into this room, you've found your chair, you sit down. There's a chair though, in the middle of all these other chairs. And in that centre chair is myself. I am sitting in that centre chair. And you should think of yourself as looking directly at me. So you're looking at the front of my body my face, my nose and eyes and mouth, the front of my chest. And also in the chairs to the left and to the right of you, there's another, another person. I want you to take their left hand with your right hand and your right hand with their left hand. So that the circle is complete. Everybody's got their left hand in somebody's right hand and everybody's got their right hand in somebody's left hand. So in doing so you're all linking together in harmony, in wanting to do the same thing. to commune in a synergetic way to amplify our ability to connect. To help with this connection, we have to connect to a single source, a single interface. Now that, in this instance, would be me. It doesn't need to be me. If you do it physically with a group of you, doesn't have to be 
me in the centre, it can be the group leader or the meditative narrator. But in this instance it's me. So I want you to visualise your heart chakra being open. Imagine this chakra as being a cone and the small diameters towards the body. In the centre of the sternum, the sternum is where the left hand and right hand aspects of the front of the ribcage join together. And that chakra is extended to its maximum extension, which is around 250 millimetres or 9 inches, sometimes up to 12 inches or 300 millimetres. And just rotate it clockwise. Don't worry about visualising the rotation, just ask it to rotate clockwise and it will do so. And that brings in energy. But what I'd also like you to do is send out energy to me. All of you send out a link via this heart chakra to my heart chakra. In your visualisation, each of you is looking at the front of me. So you're all looking at my front heart chakra, the front aspect of my heart chakra. So in doing so we're all linked together. Now I want you to move your consciousness, your sentience, your focus, out of that little area just behind the eyebrows where you feel your the seat of your consciousness is move it down your spinal column and push it out through the heart chakra and in towards my heart chakra. Just behind, just behind the heart chakra is the soul seat. This is this where the sentience coalesces. So make your sentience, your consciousness come down from its location in this in in the head just behind the eyes, down to, down through the spinal column, out through the heart chakra, into my heart chakra, and into this area called the soul seat, which is about 75 millimeters or three inches in towards the center of the body from the location of the heart chakra. And just coalesce there. As each and every one of you joins together in this centralized soul seat we start to feel that we are becoming much more than ourselves individually much more than the sum of those individuals participating and we become a function of the synergetic effect of the number of individuals participating. As a general calculation for this, it's basically the square of the sum. So if there's two people involved, then it's the square of the two. Two times two is four. So it's like having four people involved. If we have five people involved, it's five times five. The synergetic effect is, is it's like we're having 25 people involved. If there's 12 people involved, it's 12 times 12. It's like we have the, the effect of having 144 people involved.
feel how expanded you feel. From this soul seat, this collective synergized soul seat, we can easily communicate with Source. Visualize your sentience moving up from this collective soul seat, up through the spine of me, my spine, in through my head and out through the crown chakra and symbolically upwards. Symbolically means up the frequencies and communicating with source. Ask the source to communicate with you directly, giving you information and knowledge, knowingness, functionality that you wouldn't normally have on your own. So we'll just stay here for a moment where you individually commune with Source, gaining ability, function and knowledge, relevance to your own individual cases, but in relevance to your amplified condition whilst in this synergetic state. We'll just stay here for a few minutes before we withdraw. So just relax and allow the information to come. Allow yourself to think about the questions you may want to ask. ask. And as you've thought about them, you've already asked them. In the work I was talking about at the start of this satsang, I talked about the bliss state. The bliss state you will have experienced when we all connect via the centralized hub of my soul seat, which becomes our soul seat moving upwards through the, ch the spine and then through the crown chakra, connecting with source, moves us out of this condition where we are experiencing the bliss state and we experience communion, connectivity. When we experience connectivity and communion and, and dialogue with Source, we are becoming God-realized. We'll just here for, stay here for another moment or two. In your own practice later, you can spend as long as you like here, bearing in mind that you do have to come back to the physical to deal with the rest of your commitments. So if you want to extend this time, you can turn off the recording or put it on pause for any length of time you need to from this point onwards.
So having taken the time that you wished in this particular level of immersion, you can, if you haven't already done so, take the pause off, or if you're just working with the time in the real time of this particular recording, just continue to work with the, my voice and st start to withdraw yourself from this connection with source, bringing your focus or your consciousness back down through your crown chakra, back down through the head area, which, which would be me and my spinal column and back towards this collective soul seat which is just behind the heart chakra and so you can disconnect from the communion state of us all being in the same soul seat and move back down through this energy that you may have projected from your heart chakra to my heart chakra withdrawing it back into your own heart chakra. You can stop the rotation of your chakra, your heart chakra and, and withdraw it back in towards your body if you wish. Although this closes the heart chakra down, it doesn't actually stop it from working. We never actually stop our heart chakras or um, stop the functionality or any other chakra if we use this type of um, of method of extending and gaining energy from them and projecting energy. It's just that um, we achieve, we, we go back to like a tick over state, a, a neutral state. Okay. Now I want you to disengage from the other people in the room. So whosoever hand you had in your right hand, whosoever's left hand you had in your right hand, just let go of their right of their left hand with your right hand and let go of the person's right hand with your left hand and slowly stand up from your chair in this white room and move back towards the white door So move back towards the white door, open the white door and step back into this white corridor, closing the white door behind you. Give thanks to the participants who are with you and move back down towards the end of the white corridor where you entered into this particular meditative state. When you achieve your end of your journey of working, walking from this white door to the end of the white corridor. Focus your intention to coming back into the room where you are physically. So slowly come back into the room that you're in, open your eyes, and if you have any water to help ground you, take a drink of water. If you don't have any water, slowly get up and go to the kitchen or the fridge to get some refreshment. Fruit juice is okay. Water's better. And this will help to ground you. And don't forget just to check yourself and make sure that you're all here. Okay, you should all be here. Everybody's protected during these meditative conditions on the satsangas. Everybody's returned. It's all checked by myself, making sure you're all back. Even when we do these things months later. The energy associated with being in the event space, in the now of the initial transmission of this satsanga is maintained. 
So those who do it in a year's time or two years' time will still be in this now, now, and therefore protected. Okay, well thank you everybody who's listening into this, this, this satsanga. Um, it will be transcribed as well and will go on the website as a blog. And um, so you can ask questions via the forum if you wish. We have a forum master to look after that forum as well. And it will be presented to you all via my own website and via the blogs. There will be a link to it. It will be quite a large file, so be patient in um, downloading it. It will be quite a large file because it's a higher, higher quality file than I've usually used. So it's an M4A file. And when Kevin um, puts it onto the, the Moore Show, as part of the, the Moore Show um, broadcasts, it'll probably be augmented by some visual aids as well. Okay, just to help you get into the mood of it. So I thank you all for being part of this satsanga. And again, I'll broadcast what the satsanga will be for those uh, existing participants who were with me for five years in doing the live satsangas. I'll send out the, uh, the general agenda fairly soon for that. Thank you again and thank you to Kevin for being part of this and for allowing us to work together in this way and for the World Satsanga to be part of the function of the Moore Show. So thank you everybody and I wish you well and God's love to you all. Did you see the aliens in Crete?